A lot of people get into Scientology, or at least their um, disseminated Scientology, at kind of like a low point in their life, or kind of a stage in their life where maybe things aren't so good. And for me, it was actually the exact opposite. I got into Scientology probably at the, like a, a peak. You know, life is full of peak and valley, peaks and valleys, but I think it was definitely a peak for me financially, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically. I mean, all these different things in my life. It was really like a really wonderful time for me. I had just um, shut down a very successful business. I was just about to turn 30. I had really no ties. I was going to do some traveling. And I basically, you know, I had, I got contacted by the Boston organization. And I had actually been interested a few years prior to in the purification rundown. And um, somehow or another, they lured me in there. And um, that's when it started. It was around Christmas, or New Year's of 2009 was when I started in Scientology. So. My initial introduction or foreign to Scientology was for the purification rundown, simply because I was interested in physical health. I was interested in detoxification, just kind of my, 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 my natural in inclination towards very healthy living and you know, certain, eating certain things and, and living a certain way. So yeah, that's how I got in initially. Scientology tends to do this, this thing where everything works for everybody. And they try to simplify um, human beings and simplify situations. So for someone like me, who's like in pretty good shape and takes care of themselves, being in a sauna for a few hours a day isn't a big deal. I mean, I, I can handle that. Um, but I think for other people, maybe, it could be really a significant health risk. So my personal experience in the period was actually positive. But I could imagine how a lot of people, it wouldn't be positive. So, and, and that's one of the basic problems with Scientology, is they think everything works for everybody, especially Scientology. And that's, a, and that's just not the case, and it's, it's a falsehood. And their, their means of selling that service is totally um, dishonest and, and not based in fact. When I was in the Purif, I was reading a, a succession of Scientology literature, listened to tapes, um, and like, you know, the, this kind of idea of like the love bombing started, where like the, all the organization would come in and tell me how great I was and, you know, so on and so forth. And they knew that I was financially independent and they knew that I could, if I wanted to, I could pay the whole bridge that day, you know what I mean? So, what happened was is I decided to buy an intense, a package of 12 intensives, which is 144 hours of auditing. So I did that, and then I started the process of going up through the grades with a uh, Class 6 auditor at the Boston organization. How much did that cost? Um, that was, I think, about $28,000. Yeah. This is not a, a poor man's religion. It's, no, it's not. It's, this is another interesting thing that I actually like to give a side comment on. Um, Scientology, it's really fascinating because the philosophy is a poor man's philosophy. See, Scientology is not an intellectually, I wouldn't call it stimulating. You know, like L. Ron Hubbard wasn't Hegel or Kant or any of these brilliant writers on metaphysics. He was a guy from the outback of Montana who, yeah, he was a smart guy, but he was certainly not an academic. So it's really interesting that people say Scientology is a, like a rich man's religion. It's a poor man's religion that costs a lot of money, which is really interesting because Scientology, I mean, you very rarely find, in the beginning you did, right? You find a lot of really kind of intellectual people that were interested in, you know, like Huxley was interested in, Burroughs was interested in. And, you know, if it was, maybe if it was run like a nice organization today, maybe there would be some really smart people in, interested in it right now. But Scientology is, it's a really interesting di dichotomy. It's a poor man's religion that costs a lot of money. Because Hubbard, basically what he did is he, is he simplified these complex truths in a way that is digestible for somebody that has no background in metaphysical training or spiritual understanding. And he makes these simple things like be, do, have, or the dynamics, or ARC, these things that are you know, fairly easy, di easily digestible for somebody who hasn't been exposed to any theological or spiritual tradition. Yet it costs a lot of money, you know, which, which is the total ironic thing about Scientology. So yeah, to answer your question, it's, it's not a poor man's religion financially, but I think it, it could be um, introduced that way to somebody who doesn't have, let's say, high levels of, of training in, in different things. As, as, as I look back at it, I, I have a little different experience of it as I look back at it now, but in the moment I was kind of caught up in this idea that, you know, like the human potential or, or some kind of enlightenment process was happening. And I did feel like I was making some gains. I did feel like I was you know, handling some issues that may have, may have hampered me in my life. 
And, and more than that, I felt like the, boss, the people in the Boston organization themselves were actually nice people. You know what I mean? I felt like I couldn't believe that these people worked for like $50 a week and were doing all these amazing things. So I had a lot of respect for the work they were doing. And I did feel like in a weird, I mean, you know, I was obviously aware that it was very expensive. And um, so I guess it was that part of it that kind of hooked me, like I was going to get something even more than, you know, there was always kind of a, a carrot, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, overall things went good because that's when I decided to go down to Flag because it was going well. You know, I didn't decide to go to Flag because I was in this, you know, terrible situation and I was being abused daily. I decided to go to Flag because I felt like I was making progress in my own path. The experience of Flag was was overall torturous from the first day to the last day. And I spent, I was at Flag for approximately seven months, six, seven months. And I spent the whole time trying to undo the torture. You know, I spent the whole time trying to figure out if I had caused the mental torture, or they had caused it, or what was going on. But I, I would say the incredible difference between the the general attitude and the way human beings are treated at the Boston organization versus how they're treated at the flag organization was incredibly tangible, incredibly obvious, and um, also incredibly sad. Looking back on it, like the, like the head organization of this religion is so um, inhumane versus a low organization that is more humane. I wouldn't even call them humane at this point. I would just call them more humane than their kind of like mothership. Well, what do you mean by inhumane? Um, <laughs> what do I mean by inhumane? I mean inhumane, um, I mean an incessant and nonstop um, need for money. That in and of itself I thought was inhumane. Um, a consistent um, series of very subtle invalidations and very subtle criticisms of who I was as a human being and what I was doing with my life. Um, give, give me an example. When I, I'll give you a few examples, but I mean one of the most, um, one of the most examples, and I think back in the fact that I didn't like walk up and leave that day, was when Dave Foster who was a registrar at the flag organization, who I actually liked. You know, he was an interesting guy. He went to Dartmouth. He had this really interesting past. And um, he was trying to reg me for, um, to buy my whole bridge. And I had said to him, he had been doing it for like a week or so every day. And I finally said, Dave, you know something? I'm not going to do it. Just I'll do it when I'm ready. And he called me a fucking asshole. He's like, you're a fucking asshole, Brian. And I was just kind of like, whoa, did you just really say that? You know? And, you know, one of the things that's interesting about Flag, too, I have never in my life, never in my life, you know, and I'm a guy that's, I've lived in different countries, I've been, I've, I've seen a lot in, at, at a young age. I have never heard an organization in and of itself use profanity and four-letter words more than, it's like, you know, a collection of truck drivers that work at the Flag Service Organization. I mean, from the 15-year-old girl to the, I mean, I've never heard more F words in my life. So... Him saying the effort wasn't surprising, but the way he directed it at me as a very personal, you know, you're a fucking asshole, that was a little surprising that day. So, I mean, and that was really the least of my, I mean, in many ways, I actually appreciated the honesty of that. You know, there was far more very subtle um, ways of invalidating me as a human being that I really didn't even pick up on because it was happening at like in such a way that I didn't quite get it. You know what I mean? So... I think that my entire experience there, not only the actual process of me doing auditing, which was, was, was really, really painful, um, very traumatic actually, um, but also the various kind of like social elements, the financial element, and overall just kind of like being lost in this maze, in this like mental maze that I didn't even know I was in. You know what I mean? I, I knew there was something wrong and I knew that I didn't feel good and I knew that my, like my intuition, but I was still going over the, I was still using the idea that it was my fault, that I must have done something wrong for this to happen, you know? A, a basic Scientology um, kind of philosophical 
underpinning, I guess, is this idea that if you're part of a group and you leave the group suddenly, right, then you must have committed some kind of a crime or some kind of wrongful action within the context of the group. Um, and you know something? It's really interesting because at the time, I thought that made sense and I thought there was some rationality to that. And then I went back and I, I thought of this example that I use for people. And it's like, imagine if you were in a restaurant and imagine if you ordered something and the price was more than what you paid for. For instance, like the, you ordered chicken and it said on the menu 20, but they actually charge you 25. Not only that, but the chicken tasted horrible. And not only that, the entire staff consistently invalidated you and said things about you and didn't treat you like a, like a patron. And then when you get up to leave the restaurant, they all get around you and say, hey, what did you do? Because no one leaves this place without, the only people who leave this restaurant are people who do bad things. That's Scientology. And that's the trap that they get people into. And that's the trap. So you have all these people who are eating food, you know, metaphorically speaking, the food doesn't taste good, the food's overpriced, the waiters and the chefs are treating them horribly, and then they want to get up and leave, and they feel like they can't because they've been taught that anyone who leaves a restaurant, it must, they must have done something wrong. So, and there are people, Mark, in this situation for 30 years. 30 years. I mean, I was in this situation for a few months, but even in the beginning, I knew there was something wrong, but I was willing to give it some time to explore it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I got to the point where it was just, it was just too crazy. It was too, um, it was violating too many of my personal principles that I was just like, this is just, this is totally crazy. I find it interesting that in Scientology, uh, if something doesn't work, yeah. you did something wrong. Yeah, it's interesting. And then, you know, when you try to turn it around on them, you know, for instance, because like one of the things that I did, as I said a couple of times, well, if, if it's not working for me and you're the, the auditor, it's not working for you either. So what did you do wrong? And they didn't like that at all. You know what I mean? <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's like a two-way flow. And I said that a couple times. And I said, well, what did you do? Because it's not working for you either. Because working for you is me being happy and me having a good experience. And the woman was like, oh, well, hmm, I don't know. And I said, well, you should think about that maybe. And that didn't go over good. I had to go see ethics, you know, for something like that. But, you know, that... That reasoning can, it's, it's so like, you know, rhetorically easily beatable. Could you just throw right back to them? Well, it's not working for you either. So what do you do? You know what I mean? And the danger with that is that once you start to speak directly against the organization, you can get yourself in trouble. So people just go along with it. You know what I mean? Because they have so much time and money and family and, and different relational ties associated with the organization that they can't, they can't get out. What happens if you get in ethics trouble? I don't know because I was never in too much ethics trouble. I, I was in a little ethics trouble for being PTS a couple of times. They, they, they tried to say I was PTS because I wasn't um, happy with the auditing. You know? So they tried to find some kind of person who was antagonistic to me. And you know, I think back in it now, I was PTS to these people. You know what I mean? Like the whole organization was basically suppressing and invalidating me as a human being. And because of that, I wasn't making progress and I wasn't you know, happy and I wasn't you know, all experiencing all these things that myself as a human being is, is, is able to experience.